All right, welcome everybody. We are going to get started here. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's Ali here from Hi Bob, and we're so excited to have you for today's session. Um, you know, before we get started, there's no doubt that the last few weeks have been a real challenge for everyone in the workplace. Uh, but I believe nobody has had to adapt and strategize more quickly than HR and people management teams in the last few weeks. Um, you know, our clients here at Bob and some of the fastest growing companies in the world have told us that some of the challenges they're facing in the current climate is onboarding people remotely, getting managers engaged, uh, and keeping company culture alive with a globally distributed team who is working from home. Um, we hope to really help you guys with those concerns today. On the webinar, I have Andrew Bardsley, who is the eyes and ears behind people and culture programming at one of HiBob's clients, Modular. Um, a little bit about Modular, they've grown 94% over the last year, 273% uh, over the last two years. And in the time since Andrew has been with them to structure their onboarding practices, he's seen the addition of over 70 new hires, um, including people starting this very week uh, remotely. So really excited to hear him talk about how he's built an onboarding machine, um, particularly in a remote environment. Uh, after Andrew, we'll also hear from Frankie Kemp from People Skills for Geeks. Uh, for those who know Frankie, she's a very well-regarded remote interpersonal communication specialist. Uh, you know, her mission has always been to help companies and people take their interpersonal communication to the next level. And today she'll be talking through how HR can motivate, delegate to, and coach new employees and managers to maintain an amazing employee experience remotely, uh, particularly for new joiners. Uh, you know, before we get started, our goal here at Bob is always to give our community tangible takeaways that will help you guys attract, excite, and retain top-tier talent, even in this crazy world we're living in, and we're very excited to do that today. Uh, as always, we'll be doing a Q&A after both of our presenters, so feel free to ask questions in the chat box, and we'll uh, address them towards the end of the session today. Um, in the handout section, we've also included a free link to our onboarding guide. Um, Hopefully that will help as well with any struggles that you're facing at the moment. Uh, but without any further ado, I'm really excited to introduce Andrew. So Andrew, take it away. That's great, Ali. Thanks very much, and uh, welcome everyone. It's um, it's great to be here. Really, really excited to share a little bit about um, our onboarding journey at, at Modular. So um, very, very quickly, a, a little bit about about me and, and my background. So um, I was um, or am sort of traditionally from a learning and development background. So um, at previous role, I looked after leadership development, uh, um, you know, onboarding programs, soft skills development. Um, but um, I think my passion has always been in, in onboarding. I think, uh, I'm not sure what it is, but I just uh, really love uh, making sure everyone gets a, a great welcome to set any organization that they do. Um, the organizations that I've worked with have typically been uh, very fast moving, fast growing organizations. So, uh, like Ali said, Modular has grown um, a significant amount even since I joined in uh, in December. So, I think over 70 people have joined us. And in previous roles, um, saw an organization move from about 100 people to 1,000 people in just, just over two years. Um, and you can imagine the challenges we faced uh, in terms of onboarding there. So. So yeah, there's a few things that I want to I want to cover today, and um, mostly uh, they they sort of circle around this this topic of of psychological safety. Um, so I guess you know starting a new job is is a nerve wracking time uh, for for all of us. Um, if I ask you to think back to the, sort of the last time you you joined an, a new organisation, I'm I'm sure you'd start to to feel butterflies in in your stomach, sweaty palms, you know, feelings of of apprehension about your your new team you know did you make the right decision um you know is this the right company for you you know and i know i know when i joined modular back in in december i certainly felt all of these uh, all of these things you know it's a stressful time um which is why it's so important that that we make um, an excellent first impression you know and i'm and i'm, I'm sure you've I've heard some of the stats um, you know, that, uh, you know, companies who get onboarding right are able to um, sort of reduce new starters time to competency by an average of 62 percent. Companies who get onboarding right are also able to retain uh, 91 percent of their em employees within within their first year. And I think that's probably one of the one of the most sort of important stats. Uh, you know, retention is, is, is so key. Um, we want to sort of retain and train the, the, the top talent that we, that we find out there and if we can 
you retain 91% of it, then that's a fantastic way, um, fantastic sort of milestone. You know, an, an employee onboarding is, is a big deal. Um, yeah, lots of, of companies manage uh, onboarding as a sort of the equivalent of, of sort of chucking a, a novice swimmer into, into the deep end. And, uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure that some, some people would turn out to be sort of Olympic athletes, but mostly um, people only just manage to, to tread water and, and keep their, their head above, above the surface. And that's why I wanted to sort of briefly talk to you about uh, the process that I like to follow, um, you know, when it comes to, to onboarding, and it does sort of encompass elements of, of psychological safety. Now, I'm in no way professing that I'm a, a professional in this, um, and I'm only going to scratch scratch the surface, but um, I wanted to introduce a few concepts to you, and hopefully something will uh, will spark some interest in, in some, of you, some of you out there. So. Um, there isn't really a direct uh, sort of model that I like to use when it comes to, to psychological safety, but um, the way I like to think is based on three sort of central ideas. Um, and these were introduced to us by, by a chap called uh, David Rock. Um, and I want you to I want to encourage you to think about these these things when uh, sort of when you when you're thinking about your on onboarding programs. Um, so the first point is around our brain and, and how our brain thinks about um, sort of social threats and sort of thinks about social threats and, and rewards with the same sort of intensity as physical threats and rewards. So I'm going to be, give you an example of that in, in a second. Um, the second point is around our capacity to make decisions, solve problems, um, collaborate with others is, is generally reduced by a threat response and is increased under a reward response. And also the threat uh, response is, is much more intense and more common um, and often needs uh, sort of to be carefully managed and minima minimized in, in social interactions. So if I give you an example, so maybe a perceived threat um, like not knowing what to expect on, on day one of your new job. Um, this would sort of activate similar brain networks to, to a threat to your safety, to a threat to your life. And in the same way, a perceived sort of increase in these sort of expectations of your first day would activate the same type of reward circuitry as, as receiving a, a monetary reward or something like that. So you can see there's really tangible things that our brain does um, when, it, when it's sort of presented with threats um, to, to our sort of social uh, environment. And sort of understanding this uh, sort of feeling safe in, in our social interactions are, are real primary needs and, and we need to help individuals and leaders sort of better navigate the social world and the social workplace and we can really drastically improve our onboarding offering if we are mindful um, of how these points affect our new joiners. And, and at the moment, this is more this is more prevalent than, than ever, given our current situation. You know, I'm sure many of you are operating remotely at the moment, and that just adds an, an extra layer of, of complexity to an already ambiguous and, and fast paced world um, that, that we currently live in. So it is really important that we consider this this concept of, of psychological safety. And I'm, I'm going to cover three sort of main areas, the three C's um, that I sort of use in my in my onboarding programs. Um, and again, hopefully this will spark some some ideas and some some thoughts for, for you guys out there. So uh, the first C is uh, around clarity. Um, so most humans don't do well with uncertainty. Um, uncertainty triggers our sympathetic nervous system, um, it releases the stress hormone cortisol, and this invites that fight, flight, or freeze state. And this is absolutely not a state we want our new joiners to, to be feeling or to be in. We want them to be curious about their new job, we want them to feel connected with, with the business. So it's so important to help your new hires um, relax and we can do this by eliminating any of those sort of unnecessary mysteries about their, their role and their, their employment. So setting expectations, eliminating mysteries is, is as easy as sending an email or two before the new hires start date. And, you know, this also keeps new hires engaged, gets them excited and uh, encourages them to, to remain engaged with, with the role. I like to send a welcome email sort of detailing the agenda for their first week, you know, giving them sort of clarity of, of what to expect. And what that does is it, is it reduces the, the fear of, of the unknown and, and allows the new joiner to, to, to come into the, the role at their best and, and ready to tackle anything. 
and and Bob is is really great in helping us um, achieve clarity as well. Um, so we're really reliant on their personalized onboarding feature. We we use that for all of our new joiners. This guides new joiners through all of the information that we need from them, but it also introduces them to their buddy, introduces them to their team, introduces them to the business, and this clarity of what to expect, um, you know, is is so great in helping them sort of feel safe and ensuring the new joiner isn't um, in that sort of state of threat um, and ultimately allows them to be to be at their best. So that's a little bit about clarity. Um, the next C is confidence. Um, so a large part of this this confidence piece comes from sort of the information and, and orientation sessions that we that we sort of that we give to our new joiners at modular we call these 101s and i'm sure that people out there on the call today um, do similar things where you sort of deliver information sessions maybe in person or through a learning platform and this is great you know that really does help build confidence but what i'd like to what i'd like to encourage you to think about um, is a sort of a different element of confidence um, and sort of more relevant to this idea of psychological safety. Um, and it's around the confidence that the new joiner has made the right decision to join your organization. And this is where managers play a hugely important role. Um, they, um, and, and we sort of work with managers really closely to ensure that the right messaging is shared with, with new joiners at the right time. So it's you know it's very easy for for us and for managers to to sort of dive in to um, you know once the once a new joiner's first day is over it's very easy for us to dive into immediately setting goals immediately talking about targets and and what we need them to achieve by when and you know on day two that's probably going to be a little bit overwhelming for our for our new joiners so what we encourage our managers to do is to is to think about you know, instead of diving straight into the detail, um, we encourage them to think about how instead of the what. So at Modular, all of our teams um, have developed a team charter. Um, and what this does is it outlines the team's purpose, the behaviors that we value, um, and also the team's commitments to the business. And you know, we work with managers to ensure that this team charter is, is sort of remains relevant, remains up to date, um, and this should be the first port of call for, for a manager when inducting someone into their team. Um, and once we have this sort of context embedded, once the new joiner understands how they can go about their job, then we can focus on goals. Um, and the new joiner will obviously be then seeing these, these goals, these targets through a different lens. And this lens helps them feel connected to the goals, but also connected to the business and get them to the culture, um, just really understanding that broader um, sort of sense of, of how. So the, the team charter model is just something we use, but there are many other things out there. So Tuckman's model, group, uh, group development, uh, the forming, norming, storming, I'm, I'm sure some of you have, have heard of that. Or maybe Patrick Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team, that sort of almost hierarchy of needs for, for a team. Any of these types of um, models can work, but I think the most important thing is to think about how we're going about our goals and, and targets rather than diving straight into what and hopefully that will then build the confidence of the new joiner that they've made the right decision joining uh, joining your business okay my third and final c is is all about connection um so our brains are obsessed with fitting in um especially in a new in a new environment the need to to belong is is really deeply ingrained within us and you know whenever we feel excluded or, or not connected our brains register it or register it as if we're feeling and experiencing physical pain it's that sort of um it's that intense so it's it's no surprise that satisfying this need to belong ye yields the greatest sort of um onboarding returns in respect to sort of commitment to time to performance retention um, but it's not just about people feeling connected, it's also about us creating connections to information, to resources, to a wider network. So it really is a, a sort of broad ranging um, topic of connection. Um, and one of the easiest ways that I've found to, uh, to help connection, especially for organizations who are going through a, a really rapid period of high volume recruiting, is to, uh, is to standardize your intake days. And I know this might seem like a really um, simple thing to do, but um, we have 
two intake days a month where new joiners can uh, can join the business and usually we'll have about you know five or six people in, in across different locations all joining at the same time um, and the great thing about that is this group will go through their onboarding together they'll discover things together help each other through the first days the first weeks you know and it's amazing to see that um, you know and the sort of new recruits feeling like they belong to something as soon as they um, arrive to uh, to the business. This does require some convincing. It does require working with your hiring managers and and sort of almost um, selling this concept and helping them understand the benefits that they're going to get from this. But uh, it certainly is something that we've um, we found really really um, valuable. The second approach to to connection is is our uh, buddy system. You know, I'm sure all of you are familiar with with buddy systems of, of sort of varying um, levels. But um, what I want to talk to you is about is how we are using technology to sort of facilitate our buddy system. And um, we've got sort of two prongs to the uh, to the buddy system. So, firstly, we get our managers involved from the start when uh, when we're thinking about buddies. We ask them to assign the the buddy within their team, and we ask them to do that directly in Bob. So we're reducing the sort of admin load for for the for the manager. They don't have to think about um, you know what they need to do. They just have to think about who they need to to assign. And we think managers are the best place to do this because they're working day in day out with their teams, and they know who would be best person. To, to sort of introduce this uh, the new joiner to their team. The second and probably more important um, piece of technology we uh, we use for uh, for our buddies is um, an integration uh, with our Slack, um, and it's called uh, the app's called Donut. Um, and this is an amazing, uh, amazing piece of technology, and I'd encourage you to to check it out um, if you haven't heard of it already. But essentially, what What's, uh, what Donut does is um, it sits in our Slack channels. If you're not familiar with, with Slack, it's a great tool to um, sort of collaborate and communicate. We can create different channels for different teams. And what we can do with Donut is we can actually um, embed it into those channels. And then twice a week, it will randomly pair all of the people within those channels together. Um, and then you can meet up and maybe have a virtual cup of coffee or go for lunch or something. Um, but it's just a great chance to meet someone from a different location, from a different team, from a different level of tenure. And we don't only do this for our new joiners, we actually do it for everyone across Modular. So we're creating a, a really well-connected um, organization. And it's fantastic, especially over the last few weeks, we've found that so valuable, having um, you know virtual lunches with someone who you know, is maybe in the same city as you, but you're not able to see them uh, sort of face to face it's great just to sit down and take a bit of time out and and sort of really feel that feel that connection and then when we're thinking about culture for our new joiners it's it's great for them to expand their network as much as possible and as quickly as possible within those first few days so being able to go out and meet different people uh, twice a week is, is a great way to uh, really cement their decision that they've made to join us well, I think that's pretty much it from me. Um, so just quickly, a couple of final thoughts. Um, so one of, the, one of the driving forces behind a structured, engaging and informative onboarding process is this, this idea of, of psychological safety. Starting a new job is, is scary for all of us um, and our brains can often perceive this as a threat and, and produce that fight, flight or freeze response. We, we wanna try and minimize that perceived threat as much as possible to ensure that our new journeys are um, you know, able to bring their full self to work and sort of be at their best from day one. And we can do this by providing clarity through a structured plan, confidence through uh, the sort of understanding of the business and also um, our ability to connect um, people with each other um, in various ways and we can ensure we provide a safe and inclusive environment for for everyone and if just to finish on a slightly cheesy note but um, you never get a second chance to make a first impression so make yours the best and that's everything from me thank you andrew um, yeah, lots of good tidbits in there that I think will help our, you know, the fast growing companies in the Bob community as well. Um, I think one of the, the most important things that I'd like to highlight is, you know, helping convince hiring managers that the importance of creating a great onboarding sometimes trumps business needs. You know, I know I'm guilty of it as a hiring manager. Like if I have a new joiner start, I want them as quickly as possible, you know, yesterday, if possible. 
And so I think yeah. figuring out a way to get people to start together and prioritizing the, a smooth onboarding experience can actually be sometimes more beneficial in retaining the employee long term. So I really like that you highlighted that. Um, you know, I think this concept of of motivating and delegating to managers is one that has been extremely prevalent in the dialogue in HR in recent years. And I think it's even more prevalent now that everybody's working from home. So, uh, you know, with that I'd love to turn the floor over to Frankie Kemp, um, who will talk a little bit about how to motivate, uh, delegate tasks to and coach both managers and employees to create an amazing communication and HR experience internally. So with that in mind, um, I would like to have Frankie take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Ali and Andrew. That was so timely. Um, what I'm going to give everybody, everyone that's listening in, is not just um, the ability to feel, to make others feel psychologically safe, but also these are tips that you can use for yourselves because they say we're all in it together and it really is true. Everything has changed for you. Suddenly you're working from home, you're dealing with maybe a global workforce or a very fast growing company and you need to make sure everybody is on the same page. So keeping yourself together as well as everybody else and that's what it's all about. And um, without further ado, I'm going to give you all a little bit of a quiz. So you're going to hit the chat box. So over here, I'm going to show my screen because that would also be a very good start. Um, and we're going to go on to this. So answers on a postcard, but easier in the chat. If you can guess what this figure applies to. So Frankie, so, I'm not sure if we can see your screen. Really? Oh, we okay. Can. No, we can. I think we can. Yep, we're good. The magic has happened. <laughs> So you can see the full screen, right? Ali? Yeah, I can see the full screen. Exactly. So are there any answers coming in? Is yes. it the amount that you earned per minute sitting on the sofa? Perhaps. So we we have Ellen saying that it's the cost of a failed onboarding. Uh, we have Tina saying it's the average cost of a new starter. We have Caroline guessing that it's the cost of hiring. Uh, Julia also says a new hire cost. Uh, Kiara says the cost of not retaining an employee. Are we all on the right track? Oh, right. Caroline, Julie, et al. You are all on track. So this is really the cost of hiring a new employee. And that's sort of the median level. So when you're talking about senior, you're talking even more. And this would include the amount that from interviewing, to the ads for advertising, to the uh, the whole onboarding process, which for some companies can take six months, for some it could take a year. So according to HR review, this was very much the figure, the, the medium figure for hiring. So we wanna kind of keep that down. We don't wanna have to hire and rehire. We wanna keep people on. So this figure over here is, 70%. Now, I want to ask you to do another guess, but 70% is how much less likely people are to quit if you onboard well. So, if you make this a great experience for people, they're less likely to quit. Now, what I'm going to offer you is some insider information. So, I've got a little treat for you. So, stick around to the end. Uh, you can go off and make your tea at the end because we're going to be covering how to motivate people. But this has an extra edge because this is all about making your life easier. So how you can sort of delegate the motivation off to other people so it's not all on you. The next is delegation. And lastly, so how you can delegate co um, your, your tasks out to other people and also how you can coach managers to be people people. So um, as my, my company is Switch Vision, um, it will be Frankie Kemp and we're launching the new website this week. It's all very exciting. Bugles out. Um, what I do is actually go into companies and help people like Kaspersky and AXA 
and other international companies and colleges all around the world to do these things, but to also use communication skills to unite people and make sure your message is clear and you are building connection. So this very much reinforces those basic psychological needs that we need at every single level that Andrew touched upon. So this is insider knowledge and there is a little gift at the end. So without further ado, let's go on to how you would actually motivate people. So um, speaking to somebody that I, I've trained, which um, in common purpose, an organization of about 150 people in Bar Diamond, she was saying, and I totally agree with her here, is you need the right spirit. So it's the spirit of welcoming people, of really wanting to get to know people. You know, it's, it's interesting because people say, you know, how can I work out how people are motivated? I can't see them. They're not here. They might be 3,000 miles away now. I'm not having these serendipitous meetings with people at conferences or um, team away days or anything like that. So how do I know? Do I give them a questionnaire? Well, there are ways that you can do this. So I'm going to show you how you can do this without making people feel isolated because people are feeling very isolated at the moment. And if you can work out how they are motivated, you can get people much more productive. So um, one way is to identify their motivations. Now, come on, you could send them a quiz, but you know this, right? You're probably motivated by different things depending on the different day and what mood you're in. So then if it's like pin the tail on the donkey, how do you do this with other people? So here's um, some case studies for you, LinkedIn. So LinkedIn have uh, six different values and one of them is act like an owner. So as an example, for each value, what they will do is they will gather the team together or rather they gather the manager and the new hire together and they ask the question and this is posed to both the manager and the new hire interestingly is how do you act like an owner so how are you owning your career maybe you're volunteering maybe a hobby you might be talking about your guitar playing or something you do for the red cross it could be anything because you're getting to know the whole person and they're getting to know the manager as well by also disclosing these elements about yourself you in a safe space, you are building trust. And this is extremely important because through trust, you build loyalty. You've got to know, like somebody and trust people for them to actually feel that they belong. And this is a wonderful step that LinkedIn do. And this is why they have low attrition rates. This is one of the reasons. Wipro. Now, Wipro, many of you might know the Indian call center, massive global company, and um, they had very low, very high attrition rates. And they wanted to address this because people were just kind of flooding out of the system. So they, instead of what usually happens on onboarding is you get people into a room, a virtual room, and it's what, 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 all about the company. This is the company, you're so lucky to be chosen for the company. This is what we do, this is who we are. This is our customers, these are our clients. Here's your laptop, go, bye, see you in five years, right? Now, what they did is they, they did debrief people, obviously on the company and the values, but then they got them into a room and they asked three questions. Those three questions were, what happens to you on a good day? What happens to you on a bad day? And if we were all on a desert island and we were trying to survive, what could you bring to us to help us to survive? So there were three key questions and they lasted for an hour. If you want to know what people are motivated by, ask them questions and listen with intent and curiosity. You can do this so easily remotely. Wipro are a massive global company. You could do this if you have five people in your team. And if the company doesn't do it, do it with your team. So we're gonna move on now to autonomy. Now, 
Many of you might know autonomy is a key motivator. Dan Pink talks about it, um, autonomy as a really valuable driver. And in 2017, the University of Birmingham did some very hardcore research, which actually backed this up, giving people the freedom to make decisions, to propose ideas, will actually increase motivation and productivity. So this could be anything like, let's pull together how uh, routines that you've established or how you've established a routine are working from home. Let's have a Slack chat about this. Let's um, see if we can put some really good practices into our portal. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple of other examples. So Radisson, their customer service team, they were felt a little bit paralyzed because they were always having to refer decisions up to the supervisor. So the supervisor then would, their workload would increase because they, could, they were having too many decisions foisted on them. So there was a new rule established whereby the customer facing um, staff could compensate clients up to a certain amount. And this relieved the supervisors of having to take on too many decisions. Now, you might also be able to do this by agreeing a destination and they decide the process. And all you need to do is actually, because you are accountable if you're not responsible, is go, yep, you can do it. Give it the green light, let them go and do it. Give them the resources they need and a timeline, it's done. I mean, that's basically how post-it notes came out. Post-it notes <laughs> came out for 15%. I know, fun fact, 15% um, time out, uh, do your own thing. And uh, there we are. We have all those uh, sticky little bits of paper all over the place now because of that. Starling Bank um, has uh, this ability where they allow people to pitch ideas. So they can pitch to the team or they can pitch globally. Now you can think about this in any kind of context, like wouldn't it be great, especially now in a time of change and isolation where we can actually learn to be more constructive and think strategically, but it could come from all levels of the organization. So you're getting much more involvement everywhere and more connection. So over here, environment. Now environment, we know as soon as, I mean, I was discussing with Ali and Andrew before we began, I thought, oh my God, I've never, I don't think I've ever spent so long on the sofa. So, you know, have people got what they need? If you're making business calls and there's a two-year-old having a meltdown in the corner, then have you got noise canceling headphones? I'm obviously not advocating, ignore the two-year-old, but I am advocating, you've got to be able to hear the calls. So standing desks, um, basically good internet connection. Is there something there that can be facilitated to help people actually find an environment that is optimized for working? Many people are working in a one bedroom flat. Is there some advice or some help that you can give them? Now, again, in the process, in the, in the uh, flavor of actually making things easier for you, you could put them in touch with someone. And I'm going to tell you very soon who to put them in touch with and why. So you don't actually have to be the font of all answers. So I love this one. This is about getting real. I used to use the word authenticity, but now I hear authenticity is often used by people who aren't. So <laughs> I changed it to getting real. Now, um, Monzo, have one of their core values is default to transparency. They pride themselves on being very open about what they do with your information, what they do with your account. Their CEO models this. So in their two days uh, in induction, at the beginning of the onboarding, it's not the beginning of the onboarding process because I told you that begins the moment you put the advert in. But when they all gather in that space, whether it's virtual or physical, um, he is very candid about his therapy. So, you know, if you want to exemplify defaulting to transparency, that's a brave thing to do. Obviously, you'd only open yourself up 
to the degree that is comfortable. So I'm not saying, you know, just talk about your mental health problems to your new hires because you might not feel comfortable with that, but some people do. So however you can be real, whatever it is, the way you dress, the way you speak, your honesty, it gives other people permission to do the same thing and that builds up the connection and the trust. Airbnb, by the way, theirs is be a host. And what they do is they hosted people in their HQ. You can still do that online. Invite people in. Again, this can be very inspiring in times of change. It's like, listen, we know what you want. We've got something for you. We're going to bring them on a webinar. It's interactive. So think about how all of this can be transposed for your own companies right now. Thank you. Thank you, but not thank you for your hard work or we really appreciate you. What I'd like you to do now is just to think of one person right now and what would you thank them for? So just think about that right now. What have they done? Did they make you laugh? Did they send you a great email? Have they helped cope with the changes that have been going on. One thing that I saw recently in a stream was, and, and this was about last week, marketing in Jolt. They did, so Jolt is an ed startup. They did some wonderful ads, three different ads, because they've completely revolutionized their business model. And they sent the ads from marketing out to everybody so that they could have a look. And you know, people gave feedback and also marketing could also see how people loved their work. This is really, really important. And I was watching Loom because I'm gonna be sending more video emails and the CEO of Loom, he was showing how you could use video emails and you can whiz around the screen. So as soon as you switch on your screen, you see your, your face popped up. That might not be pain, painless for a lot of you, but actually it, it works really well for the recipient. And you could say, you know, I really love what you did here with this integration. So he sent something to the developers and he was allowed him to be very visual and specific in his thank you. So showing appreciation, a basic human need and one that really will help to propel people and it will actually get people to do more. Um, learning styles. Now, um, there are three elements with the onboarding. We're talking, I've been talking a lot about the social element, but there's also building up skills and you also have the systems element, which I'll touch upon later. So with Monzo, for example, when they train people, they don't give out uh, some sort of questionnaire saying, what's your learning style? What they do, and you can do this with Highball. So basically you can shoot out different types of learning format to your people. For example, you might prefer a video. Somebody else might be saying, just give me a set of instructions. Another person would say, I need a mentor that I can chat this over with. This can all be automated. This can be organized and automated so you can be scheduled and then you would shoot out the learning in various gaps so that you can reinforce lessons that actually dovetail with the way that different people like to learn so we're talking about mental diversity so cognitive diversity the way people learn and it can all be done remotely and in a motivational way again for you hands-off driving so that would obviously make your lives a lot easier connection so I'm totally backing this now, and I was nodding furiously during Andrew's talk because connection is something that we really, really want a lot of. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was going, God, I miss hugs. I've been with my clients who've been doing this sort of virtual webinar hug, which you can all do right now if you want. I don't mind, I don't mind. I wouldn't consider it as unprofessional. So um, an example of how connection has been, um, 
has been brought to life is with Centrica. So Centrica, they use Yammer and they do Yam Jam sessions. So with these Yam Jam sessions, this is a real time Q&A between the employers and the SMT to voice their concerns and to address any queries they might have. Now, it has been shown through research that employee motivation increases when they have contact with senior, management, senior managers and CEOs. And I know some CEOs have gone into hiding almost. They've become invisible in their companies. And this leaves HR with a sort of motivational vacuum in a way, because if they could just be present and say, we care, we are, we are thinking about this and we are going to push us through this time of uncertainty, even if you don't know what it is yet, they know that you're on it and that you have queries. Just listen. You don't have to be coming up, the, the SMT don't have to be coming up with answers. They just need to listen because if people feel that they're listened to, then they feel acknowledged. It's the same as the thank you. Again, many of you are familiar with Maslow, right? So you know that this means something to you as well as all the people that work with you. Flywire, the payments platform, they use Slack. And what they do is this wonderful little thing where they do, uh, they have different Slack groups. So they have one for uh, single people who are away from home. They have a nice one on, on a Friday afternoon, and that is a storytelling time for children. And I said, oh my God, I'd love to join that. Just sit back on a Friday night on a Friday <laughs> afternoon and, and listen to stories. I mean, what a wonderful escape. Um, and it's not just, so parents read stories to other people's kids or you get people who aren't even parents and they just read stories. And you know, these are, are wonderful interactive ways that build community online. And also what the other thing that I was thinking about is since that we've all been working from home, many of you I'm sure have found that your, the demarcation between work and play becomes really fused. So it becomes a little bit murky. Now, sometimes you just wanna demark the weekend. And I think doing something like that on a Friday afternoon provides that sort of boundary between work and play and that mental reprieve that we all need. Again, are you involved? You're not, right? You're accommodating it. That's it. So now we're on to who can you delegate to? And you're probably going, thank you. Who? Give me the names, give me the people, and I shall reveal these to you. So uh, let me just talk through Monzo. So Monzo have um, 500 non customer facing people, and they have about 1,000 uh, customer facing people. And they have an onboarding team. Now, this could be done easily because you could have program coordinators. So instead of you doing this, you could actually find a program coordinator. So let's say you've got about 200 people in your company, you might want one or two program coordinators and they could work with you to draw up the, the strategy, but then you can let them go and run with it. So this is how they do it. So they have the onboarding team and then they have the, the tech team that will help with their systems and of course the, the legal team that will help with the legal systems that are put in place. Um, in week two, they need to do a lot of self-study. So they do self-study in the morning and then they have the mentors in the afternoon. So then that gives them a chance to chat through with anybody, their queries, um, questions. So they get, and also it's motivational because it's like, they know that they have to study because they're gonna have this meeting with their mentor. They don't wanna let the mentor down. And again, it's a mentor, it's not you. Then in the week three, they do their phone calls and they're handheld by the coaches because how they speak to the clients is extremely important and how many complaints there are per phone call um, is put on a matrix amongst other different indices which will help them to work out how they're doing. And between weeks four and 13, the learning is embedded through what I call the pea shooter method. 
where you schedule out, you shoot out these different types of learning to embed each lesson. That gives them the opportunity to, so as I said, you could use um, HiBob for this, and it will help them no matter what learning style they have to take in what they've learned. Now, if we look at Airbnb, so Airbnb have, I love this phrase, they have an employee experience team. Again, that's your program coordinators. So they have a hiring manager. The hiring manager sends a Jira, the project management tool, the Jira request to the IT. They fulfill the Jira request. That gets actually sent out and uh, fulfilled by other people in the technical team. Then you have the employee experience team. And I find that this is extremely interesting because what they do is they sit with the manager and they'll say, who do they need to speak to? Now, um, when I spoke to Common Purpose, they went into more detail. So Inbar Diamond went into a little bit more detail about this. She said, the managers, what, what you need to ask the managers, it's this, and I love this question. What does my team need in order to perform well? I'll repeat that. What does my team need in order to perform well? You're getting them to think strategically. So then they also need to think about who do they need to speak to? They might not need to know, for example, the inside out of their CRM, of the CRM system, because they're not in sales or marketing, but they might need to speak to marketing in order to dovetail dovetail some of the tech with marketing. So maybe they're in um, the IT side, they might need to speak to marketing to find out exactly what certain requirements are and what their challenges are at the moment. And they would arrange, so the onboarding team will arrange who they need to speak to. All these calls are lined up and basically the new hire gets on with it because all these people will speak to them. HR will speak to them, the law, the legal team will speak to them, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, there's also for, for HR, when it comes to the legal side, you've got apps like Namely, which deal with all the bank account details and for deposits. And there is another app that somebody mentioned me to me, and I'm not gonna let, I, I won't let you lose out on that because, um, That'll come later when I actually open the box and give you the treat, which I promised you earlier. So now let's look at how you're going to make those managers into people skills experts. So one of the things that I deal with is this. I often have managers in front of me in a room and they are technically brilliant and suddenly they're catapulted to the murky world of people and managing people. Now, many of the serendipitous meetings that we have are not there. The ways that you get to know your team, they're not there anymore. So how do we manage to make our managers into people people so that, again, you need to do less work? So back to Jolt. Jolt do one-to-one -one coaching on a regular basis. They, the coach will solve common people dilemmas in a confidential environment. And then once a month, they have training. And so they're all in it together to do training. So one of the things that I would often train teams on is how to influence remotely or how to actually present online in a way that doesn't lose people because forget those one hour presentations now with one person it's going to be a lot more difficult to hold people's attention now so the way we do it and the tools we use are different um i'm going to ask you a question now again hit the chat box performance reviews are key how regularly do you think you need to do a performance review let's hit that chat box The answers are coming in. Yep, I'm looking. We have uh, Natalie says quarterly. Uh, 
Emma says every two weeks. Ellen Ludden says twice a year. Wow. Okay. So I would say Natalie, excellent. Um, quarterly, I would say, is the, is the new gold standard. But, you know, every two weeks, was that Eleanor? Ali? Uh, Eleanor say Emma, Emma? Emma said every two weeks. Emma. Emma. Okay. Every two weeks. Right. Well, I would say every two weeks, every week as well. I mean, especially now, just check in with people because news is changing so fast and we are our personal circumstances are having a different impact on us on a daily basis and people are trying to set a routine. You want your people to be happy and productive. You want to find out problems. You want to nip them before they become an issue. So I would say you want to do it weekly. Um, so Flywire actually have two twice a day check-ins, but in the spirit of being flexible, because for example, I have a friend who works for a food manufacturing company, he's trying to desperately source supplies because a lot of their supply chain has disappeared. His manager wants to check in with him twice a day. He's doing his head in because he needs to find flour, for example. So, you know, you've got to be adaptable and it, it really does depend on the individual. However, I would say if you could check in once a week, so you can use apps like 15.5, to get weekly feedback loops on personal challenges and you can get updates through 15.5 and then you can schedule one-to-ones as and when needed. So you do have that quarterly and you do have the weekly and you can have a daily check-in as well. Now, Andrew mentioned Donut, love Donut because as I said, we're not having those random meetings um, and this is great for HR. Get fix up sort of randomized meetings because people, your new hires will get to know the political landscape. They'll get to know their jobs. They'll, um, they'll increase their expertise through these randomized meetings in Donut, which fits in really well with Slack and Hi Bob. So within that whole sphere, they all dovetail, they lock in together beautifully. So, we have covered, um, or before we have covered anything, I'm going to actually recap this with you. So you help them by providing those regular performance reviews. You can use software like HiBob, uh, 15.5 and Donut. And also the regular reviews will really help your people stay in touch with the goals, not only their personal goals, but the ones within your company. And you can give out goal templates. So um, HR can give out goal templates. They give them to the managers. The managers to com can complete them. And then HR or people and culture can look at those, make sure that they're explicit and they make sense to that particular employee's role. And then you can just put it away and check up on it at any given time. You are accountable, but you're not responsible for that. And then, of course, there's the coaching and training element to keep people updated and upgraded with skills, both the social skills and the technical skills that they need to do their job. So I have got two little treats for you. So what we have done is we've covered how to motivate your staff in a remote new world. It doesn't matter if they're two meters away from, well, they'd be more than two meters away from you, I presume right now, or 2000 miles away from you. You've got eight ways to motivate your staff. You've also got different tools in which you can delegate. So hopefully I've given you some ideas and some inspiration on how you can devolve your own responsibility out amongst your organization. And lastly, how you can make your managers into even more than they are now, people, people, so that you're not dealing with difficult conversations or people issues because they've exploded because the managers haven't dealt with them earlier enough. So um, another one of my 
tasks that I end up having to do is actually teach people how to have difficult conversations. This still needs to be done. You need to actually coach people also to use the right channels to do this. Is email good enough? Could you do this in a Slack chat? Is it all right on WhatsApp? Or should you be having the Zoom call? So tips and tools. Now tips and tools is, is wonderful. Uh, I'm gonna just put up some of the things that I've been covering recently. It's free. And Ali is going to give you the link to my tips and tools. And it is full of every, every week I send out to my readers videos and small, they really are short, like 400 to 600 word um, actionable content, which you can apply immediately to help you with influence, presentation, communication up, down and out of your organization. These are some of the tools, some of the um, titles that I've written about recently that have been very, very popular, how to get, make your content 10 times clearer, right down to the most recent one, which was, and I'm sure that a lot of you can relate to this, how to switch depressing video calls into positive and productive experiences. Because really, if you start off on a, uh, 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 it's sometimes very difficult to feel that, to get out of it, you need to do that but then how to get out of it so that you can be productive is really very, very key for a lot of us right now. Now, this is the bit where I open up even more, further open up the box of treasures. So a lot of you are thinking, oh my God, I, I, I couldn't take notes and I lost that. And then I have to watch the webinar again in order to find out what, what was that? What was that app? And who were those people? And what was that technique? I've got it all written for you. It's the insider's cheat sheet. All you need to do is to write to me. So you've got the email there. You've also got my tips and tools there. You will be getting all of this from Ali. If you want to shoot me an email, please do and what I'll do is I will send you the cheat sheets because as Ali says this is all about takeaways. Hi Bob is a practical tool, I give practical tools and I want you to be inspired and run away with this. If you want to speak to me it's totally free, I would love to talk to you about any people management problems that you might be having, any challenges to do with motivation, communication, building up team rituals that bond and keep people on the same page. This is an issue for many people. You want the communication, you want the clarity, and you want the connection. So also you can connect with me over there. You can see on the left, I have added my LinkedIn profile. Um, and what we're doing here is we're, we're building up the trust and we're building up connection. And I, I'm gonna quote here, Patrick, uh, Lencioni, um, and I found that this quote was so sublime, especially now, because you want to keep your head together, and you, at the same time, you've got to keep other people's heads together, and you need to be, we need to be empathetic, but we've also got businesses to run, so how do we do this, and there's this beautiful quote here from Patrick, and it says, remember, Teamwork begins by building trust. And the only way to do that is to overcome our need for invulnerability. So I'll let that settle. And as we do this, I want you to feel free to reach out to any of us because we are here to help. Thank you. Thank you, Frankie. Thank that, was you Frankie. that was amazing. Um, I uh, see a lot of questions here in the chat box already. I posted in the chat box the link to Frankie's tips and tricks, uh, tips and tools, as well as the link to speak with her. So feel free to check those out in the chat. Um, I'd now, with our last few minutes, like to open up the discussion uh, for any questions you have for myself, for Andrew, or for Frankie. Um, you know, we have two real experts in the field here who can help you navigate the challenges you're facing. Um, we have one question here from Melody that's for Frankie. Uh, so Frankie, yeah. Melody asks, what do you do when you only have one person responsible for onboarding? Sorry, what was that, Me Melody? So Mel if one person responds... If you only have one person responsible for onboarding, how do you create this system of, of program coordinators? 
Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, now that's an interesting one. So it could be that you, you need to find somebody who has the work capacity to do it. And it does mean that you need to sit with them initially. It's, as you would know, you, you need to like find somebody, identify somebody who is willing to do it and has the time to do it. But what I would do initially for you, Melody, is, is it Melanie? Sorry, Melanie, is Melody. to work out, Melanie, is work out, Melanie, what you need to ask somebody to do. So it's a job role, basically. And then work out, well, who would be the best person to do this? And it could be that you can split those tasks. So it's like a JD, just like doing a job description. So it could be that you can split those tasks between two or three people who have the time and the will to do it. Now, plan B is look at those tasks and see what you can automate. So on the cheat sheet that I give you, a lot of it you can devolve the responsibility without actually having a program coordinator. So when I, so Melanie, write to me and I'll give you the cheat sheet so you can see also that might help you just in case you don't manage to get that that job filled up. Yeah, I think one thing that we've seen be really successful with some of our clients is looking in, hi Bob, seeing who's very engaged, who's an influencer in your business, right? Who's in lots of clubs, who's very well connected, who has volunteered to be a buddy multiple times. That's how you can see the people who really care about creating a great experience internally, and those people can serve as advocates for you don't have to be an HR to be a program coordinator. And I think Frankie really helped underline that. It's about easing HR's load by using your subject matter experts internally to your advantage. Um, we have another question here from Komal. She asked how for Hi Bob, how you can use uh, how you can use different learning styles on Hi Bob, how you can use different learning styles on Hi Bob and figure out what people need. So um, it's as simple as sending your new joiners a survey or a tool through the Bob system, asking them whether they are auditory learners, visual learners, kinesthetic learners. You can also do a bit of a quiz from the system as well and see, you know, so they, to help them figure it out, provide a link to a diagnostic. And then once you have the results, you can cluster these people in groups and provide them a customized onboarding accordingly. Um, and you can do it all through automated onboarding tasks so that it eases your load as well. Uh, all right, I'm looking here um, with a lot more questions. Okay. Um, uh, this is a good one for Andrew. Uh, Andrew, what are your opinions on first day icebreakers for new starters? Oh, that's a great one. I think. Um, yeah, I suppose. I suppose in a virtual environment, I think it's a little bit more difficult. You maybe have to get a little bit more creative. But um, if you're running sort of a virtual first day um, a great one to do is uh, what's outside your window and um, so this encourages everyone to have a quick look outside their window and share with the rest of the people on the call what they're seeing what uh, what their garden's like what their street's like and just helps to bring a bit more uh, personalization i suppose to to the to the setting it's not just uh, Someone's, uh, someone's bedroom or something you actually get to understand a little bit more about what's uh, what's outside i love that yeah um, it's a good one it's a good one cool we have a question here from joaquin um his question is around how to get my managers to shift mindsets so first joaquin i i would highly recommend checking out uh our guide for onboarding for people managers in the Hi Bob Resource Center. Just go to highbob.com resources and you'll see that there. I think what I think both Frankie and Andrew can hopefully add to this as well. I think it all is about an internal communication and dialogue about the true ROI behind a good onboarding experience, right? Uh, I think a lot of people still tend to think of HR as maybe a softer function, right? A lot of hiring managers don't think of themselves as having to carry those HR needs. But ultimately, if you can show that a manager, and ultimately, if you have side-by-side -side comparisons of certain teams that have maybe stronger retention versus others, you can then provide that data to your executive team, your leadership team, and say, look, the managers who are more heavily involved in their onboarding for their teams retain this many more people. And this is how that translates to real dollars. You heard Frankie say that $37,000 is the cost of onboarding a new employee that can add up 
And if you're continually churning people or failing to retain them because managers aren't involved in onboarding or see that purely as an HR task, you're costing the business money. So I think really it's about taking the softer ideas of HR and employee experience and tying them directly to ROI. Um, Frankie, Andrew, anything to add there? Um, I have something, I think the giving a rational argument with data is just is very, very effective. But also, you know, getting the managers to speak to each other because they will have similar problems and there will be somebody there who has an answer. So again, you know, HR can take a step back and look at people who were doing it well and buddy them up with other people. Because, you know, for a lot of them, they are technically very, very capable people. And if it can, sometimes you just have to present it so the fuzzy wuzziness is taken out. It's like, you do this, then you do this. If that doesn't work, you do this. And to make, to take the, the intangibles out of it. So it's almost like a manual for people until it becomes more organic. So, you know, getting them to speak to each other. So in management training that I've done is when we start talking about these, they go, oh, my God, I didn't know you had that issue as well. So how did you do it? You know, and they, they want to learn. You don't have to incite that. You don't have to make people want to learn. And also tying them up to the larger why. Why? Because your life will be easier. You won't have to be hiring so much. You won't have to persuade people to do stuff because they'll get the goal because you've imparted the goal. So, you know, getting the why, getting them to buy into that as well. And that can be done at all levels. Cool. Yeah, and just to echo your, your point, I think data is your best friend here. I think there's, uh, yeah, something to be said for having a, a traditional survey or, or some sort of onboarding um, feedback form something because then you can take individuals who maybe haven't gone through the process um, versus someone who has and then show them back to a manager and say look this is what we're getting from people who through the process this is how they're feeling versus this is what this is how um, positive um, how much positive feedback we're getting for people who have been through the process and I think showing that side by side comparison is uh, is really really helpful you can't do once you collect data though so i'd encourage you to start doing that if you're if you're not already great um well you know we have a couple more questions here but unfortunately we're we're out of time uh thank you guys for being for participating so much uh you know all the questions here that are specific to our individual speakers i will be sure to forward them along with your email and hopefully they'll be able to answer those for you as well um, you know, everybody who's on this call and everybody who registered will get a recording of the webinar as well. Um, and of course, I will be sure to follow up in our follow-up email with, uh, with contact information for the LinkedIn of both Frankie and Andrew and any relevant other links that we need. Um, you know, it's a tough time to, to be in HR, a tough time for everyone, no matter what field you're in at the moment. Um, but I think we can all agree that the, the primary goal and mission for HR remains the same, which is still taking care of your people and making sure people have as positive of an experience working for your company as possible. Um, you know, I hope that Andrew and Frankie's insights today hopefully helped you on that journey a little bit. Uh, as always, feel free to connect with them on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to check out HiBob's Resource Center at HiBob.com. Um, feel free to email me at ali.fazal at HiBob.com as well if you have any specific questions. Uh, but until next time, that's it from us. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.